Well, while Florence is coming on shore, we've got our own little tropical disturbance coming into Texas. And the, what you're seeing here, this is uh, storms associated with basically an easterly wave coming out of the uh, Gulf of Mexico there. So we've got showers in the area. And in the background, you can see some of the downdrafts from these storms. Uh, that fuzzy area, that fog-like region, that is... Uh, rain coming down from these thunderstorms and only a very few updraft towers very weak ones that we see in the background most of those are off to the right of this image okay and then Florence uh, let's go take a look at that and uh, there's the satellite picture at this time actually that's a couple hours ago let's put that into motion and before I do that let me shut off the air conditioner And notice the uh, lack of granularity in the colder tops. Remember yesterday we ran this loop and we were seeing uh, kind of a speckled appearance along the spiral bands. Uh, we were seeing that yesterday and the days before that. Now what we have is more striated structure. It's more stratiform and what you see here is mostly the ice crystal tops and uh, these are going to be the uh, weaker uh, convective elements in the storm and we do see the spiral band structure still but uh, the eye wall only a very faint trace of that right there and yeah some of those are showing some uh, strong tops but anyway it is on its uh, decline and we'll go ahead and run that probably the one of the hardest hit areas is uh, Wilmington right around this area right here and up the uh, I think that's Pamlico Sound or no that's Pamlico um, yeah, basically the region northeast of uh, Wilmington all the way up to, I want to say that's Cape Fear there. If not, uh, it's basically whatever's there. My Carolina's uh, geography is not that strong. I'm more of a Great Plains person here. But anyway, this uh, system is in training, a lot of dry air. If you uh, picture what we had yesterday with the hurricane off the coast, there was all this uh, relatively dry air sitting up here and uh, that wrench eventually got wrapped into the circulation and also we've got the lack of uh, latent heat ground is not really a good source of uh, moisture uh, the ocean is uh, pretty important there so it is still picking up some uh, moisture off the uh, sea there and bringing that inland so as a result some of the spiral bands on the north side are very well developed and on the south side not so much because the origin is mostly from the interior region. Let's go to the radar and see the uh, picture there. And uh, looks like the center of the circulation looked, may be moving into South Carolina at this time. So that kind of vindicates the European model is trying to pull that southward. The GFS was uh, doing something like that, but I, I believe it might have been well actually I think it was uh, both models that were trying to bring it into South Carolina um, a couple days ago and uh, yeah I would say that circulation is now tracking into far northeastern South Carolina spiral bands uh, there's one right there there's another now typically when these storms make landfall we have to watch the spiral bands for uh, brief tornadoes but uh, it's been kind of a quiet uh, evening here and uh, let's switch over to velocity and uh, see the picture on that and I'm just taking a quick look here for anything that looks like uh, uh, irregularities in the velocity field that would be an indication of shear and we looked at uh, one example of that yesterday and I don't really see anything it looks fairly uniform the radar is located right here and as you get away from the radar basically you get into the uh, stronger wind fields aloft and here out in this region here we've got uh, a velocity component away from the radar of uh, 57 knots it's not terribly strong there and then of course the zero line is this uh, white line that goes like that that is a good indicator of wind flow perpendicular to the radar so keep in mind the radar is right there if we take the zero line right there there's uh, two elements to that one is that that spot right here is up at about uh, 4,200 feet. Let me show you. So down here at the uh, bottom, this is a readout of the cursor height. 
And uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to run it along that zero line from here at the radar site all the way out to uh, South Carolina. So keep an eye on the height right there. So I've got it on the radar site, and you can see it's 100 feet AGL. As we go further away, we're up at 1,000, 2,000, and then we go up to 4 and 5. So as we pull away from the radar, we get into higher heights there. So we're sampling higher and higher portions of the storm. So uh, zero line runs like that. And uh, the other aspect of that zero line is uh, anywhere along that zero line, the flow is likely to be perpendicular to the radar. So radar is right here. If we take this point right here, the winds are likely flowing like that. Same thing at that dot right there. But there's a little bit of curvature on that zero line, like right here. Well, even up here, the uh, wind flow is perpendicular to the radar. So what's happening is there's a slight twist right there. The winds are a little bit more southeasterly at that spot right there. Now on the other side, got to keep in mind the uh, center of the circulation is uh, way down to the south. So what we have near the radar site looks like uh, kind of a southeast wind component. And as we get further away, just a little bit more easterly in that area. Okay, I think before I did this, I should have pulled up the Wilmington radar. I didn't really think about that. But anyway, we do have a fairly good presentation of the uh, storm right there. And uh, spiral bands, that's where the heavier rainfall is falling. And there's been up to about uh, 15 to 16 inches falling across uh, parts of southeastern North Carolina there. Okay, let's uh, keep things moving on. And uh, let me just check in on chat, make sure things are looking good there. So yeah, we're on that uh, drawdown as uh, the system moves inland and it gets torn up by friction and uh, lack of heat and moisture. Let's see, we got Carl Burkhoff here, Shirley Keast, Funwood Tech, and uh, let's see, Carl Burkhoff reporting 77 over 67. Erica Baker, Southeast Kansas, 89 over 69. David Lombert, 88 over 72 there in the Little Rock area. Got Erica Baker and Sue M. Fun with Tech. Adam Davis. I'm sorry to hear that you're not uh, feeling too well there. Uh, Bill K. in Atlantic City. Oh, okay, yeah, Adam Davis. Uh, so you're actually feeling better. Okay, that's definitely good news. All right, let's go ahead and uh, jump right into the uh, sequence. Let me get this uh, centered here. So, yeah, starting out there, there's our uh, there's Florence coming inland, and it's now a tropical storm got 60 knot winds in there so it's just on the verge of hurricane strength but uh, it is on the decline there pressure is 975 millibars so it's lost about 40 percent of its pressure deficit there as it uh, weakens and it's moving to the west at three knots and we'll just take a quick look at the track and that's going to bring it inland so some of the problems we're going to be looking at now besides all the precip falling in this area right here is going to be the interaction with the uh, higher terrain and likely we're going to see uh, possibly a bit of flooding in uh, western North Carolina around the Knoxville area up to uh, western Virginia and then on up to the uh, Appalachian chain there and probably even more heavy rains falling from Ohio, West Virginia, Pennsylvania and New York. We still have the uh, tornado watches in effect there they are. Tornado Watch 374 is out and uh, one more along the coast. But uh, let's check out the tornado reports. And I think we're just seeing that uh, one little tornado report up there in far northeastern North Carolina. Public cited a tornado and tree damage reported. So yeah, that's looking pretty good. And let's see what happened yesterday pretty quiet so we get off kind of lucky with this hurricane 
Okay, and uh, we've got a couple of uh, products we can look at. Uh, let me pull up the uh, Dvorak satellite. And we're going to start out uh, 48 hours ago and just kind of look at the uh, trend of uh, the storm as it moved in from the Atlantic. And keep in mind the stronger, colder shades, those correspond to a stronger storm, especially when you have the circular pattern like you see right here. It's got kind of a donut appearance there. So the intensity picked up a little bit early on Thursday, and then we saw it gradually fall off in strength around midday yesterday. Started picking up a little bit of strength and then declining around midday yesterday. And then we saw it strengthen on Thursday, so it's been kind of cycling a bit here. But finally, this morning, pretty much did it in as it made landfall. And that's what you're seeing right about here. So that's uh, this morning, and you're going to see those black and whites uh, completely go away. So that's pretty much it for Florence, except for, of course, the uh, rain. Another product I've got is uh, the surface chart, and this is going to go back about 24 hours. It's going to go a little bit fast, but keep an eye on far southeastern North Carolina and look for Wilmington. And you can watch the uh, wind change and the wind strength at that one plot. So we're up to about midnight uh, this morning. You can see the sustained winds come up to about 40 to 50 there at Wilmington. And they switch around to the east as the eye passes. And then they start picking up to 56, and then you see the plot go away. So it looks like there's probably been telecommunications outages in that area. Could also be uh, damage to the sensors, one of the two. I haven't checked into that, but uh, let's look at the observations and see what happened. So we're going to go and look at Wilmington. These are the METAR reports. This is the actual raw observations from the airport there. So um, the older stuff is on the bottom and the newer stuff is on the top. So we're going to just kind of skim this from the bottom to the top. So we start out on Wednesday. This is around midday. No, that's yesterday, about midday. So we see northwest winds gusting up to about 34 knots, and they gradually increase during the evening. And then around, uh, this would probably be about 5 a.m., no, 6 a.m., got to gust up to 73 knots there, and that's going to be about... Uh, around 85 miles per hour. And you can see the visibility was cut down to three quarters of a mile in heavy rain. And the winds were coming out of the north there, so obviously the eye wall was pretty much right on them. And then from that peak wind, let's see here, we got 91 knots, and you can see the wind direction starting to swing around from northwest to northeast as that eye passes very close. So this is pretty much the uh, core of the storm right there temperature hanging on right there at about uh, 75 degrees, 100 percent relative humidity. Then the winds start coming around to the east and they start falling off a little bit. And then towards the very end, let's see what happened here. It looks like they started picking up to about 56 knots out of the southeast. This would be about uh, trying to do these time conversions in my head. That'd be about 3.30 p.m. And that's about when the, th we lost data. Looks like the wind was first to go. So we're left with temperature and dew point. And another thing that we want to look at when we look at these METAR observations is the pressure. And I would recommend looking at altimeter setting. And that's going to be these uh, things starting with A after the temperature and dew point group. So what we see here. Let me just backtrack. There's that 91 knot wind early this morning. Pressure was 28.62 and it was on its way up. In fact, I think we bottomed out with that 28.57 right there just before the winds peaked. So very likely uh, this was the passage of the eye and this was the eye wall on the northeast side. And then the pressure started coming up and I think uh, a lot of this was just the inner spiral bands coming over Wilmington there. And that's a story. We don't don't really know what caused that outage. And 
Let me uh, look at the uh, surface map. Let's check that out. This is uh, how things... In fact, let me update this. We'll get the very latest uh, data. So this should be no more than about 15 or 20 minutes old. And uh, we should be... Yeah, we're importing the data. Just about done here, and it's ready to plot. So there's our wind plots, and you can see the absence of observations in eastern North Carolina. Looks like a lot of outages in that area. Looks like a few uh, offshore stations still working, and I think the strongest winds I'm seeing are uh, this 50 knots right here at MAO, wherever that is. It's in northeast uh, South Carolina. And we'll just look at uh, one more observation, Fayetteville. I believe there's an army base there. In fact, uh, I briefed a few flights. Uh, I think that's Fort Bragg. Way back in the day, I uh, briefed some uh, crews going to that area. And I'm look, scanning this real quick, and I can see 52 knots earlier today and then gust up to 56 and of course the other thing that I look for is the pressure change and you can see the pressures are a lot higher 29.54 because they are a lot further away from the eye than Wilmington and let's see where it bottoms out that's going to be right about here so that's going to be about the closest passage of the eye to that area probably about 100 miles away or so so yeah peak gust 56 is what I'm seeing on here that's going to be about uh, It's going to be about 64, 64 miles an hour. So that's uh, definitely up there. All right, let's keep things moving and uh, start with the upper air map. So this is up at 34,000 feet. Looking at that jet stream looks very similar to yesterday. And we can see that huge polar vortex up there over northern Canada. Polar front jet from northern California up to the Dakotas and Hudson Bay. Lots of ridging across the eastern U.S. there. And let's find where the uh, center of that ridge is. Oh, it looks like that plot right there picked up a little bit of the hurricane winds, 50 knots out of the, out of the east there. So it looks like that ridge is right in that area right there, from about Asheville up to uh, Norfolk. All right. Thickness. Well, there's uh, Florence coming on shore. And up to the uh, north and northwest, we've got a frontal boundary. Position is uh, kind of similar to yesterday. I'm drawing this kind of as a stationary front because it's not moving very much. And then the tail end, I'll draw that as a cold front. So that's our uh, quick and dirty frontal analysis. They've had that fire raging in uh, Utah, right around this area here. And that's pretty close to that uh, frontal boundary. So the wind field around that front has uh, kind of caused uh, the uh, conditions to deteriorate there yesterday and today. Picking up the, uh, the winds, helping the fire to spread, and also the uh, dry conditions south of the front, bringing those relative humidities down. But up to the north, lots of cold air up there in northern Canada. However, it is locked up because the, uh, fr the surface systems are still out west. And that's helping to block the cold air before it can come south. So it's sitting up there and kind of modifying a bit. And probably by the time the surface system moves east, this, will have, uh, this cold air will have moderated a little bit. Okay, uh, precipitable water, this is showing that uh, there's definitely been an increase in Texas. We're bringing up some very uh, rich moisture from the Gulf of Mexico there. And that's with that uh, disturbance coming up into the Texas coast. We'll look at a little bit of that on the satellite loop. And then up to the north and to the west, you can see all that dry air out in that part of the country. And uh, precipitable water is well below one inch. So yeah, let's head into the uh, satellite and uh, do our region by region. We're 
run this back to a little bit earlier today so we can pick up that hurricane. There it is right there, North Carolina, and then down in Texas you can see the uh, tropical disturbance centered uh, somewhere in this area right here. All right, up in the uh, northwest, that uh, fire really stands out. Let me get back to that. There we go. That's going to be around the uh, Provo, Pro, Provo area. No, is, it, is that Provo? No, I'm thinking of Ogden. Yeah, I think that is uh, Provo right there. And uh, pretty good plume of uh, clouds coming away from that. And then out to the uh, west, we can see the uh, Cirrus associated with the uh, polar jet. And embedded in that Cirrus, some uh, gravity waves, mountain waves. So that's an indication of uh, possible turbulence, especially in proximity to this warmer air. And out in California, in the uh, San Joaquin Valley, looks like also mountain wave conditions in that area. I would expect probably rough conditions on some of the flights in that area. Pretty quiet in the uh, southwestern U.S., and you can see the monsoon is really shut down. So we'll run that in motion few clouds going up on the uh, Mogollon Rim down to Silver City, but uh, very few of them result in uh, showers. For the northern plains, we've got uh, a little bit of low cloud. That's a big uh, stratus and stratocumulus layer with some embedded storms up in the Bismarck and Fargo area. And then also we've got a little bit of uh, cloudiness associated with the polar front jet right in that area, some cirrus and alto stratus moving through that area. And then out over Wyoming, some smoke from that fire in Utah. The stratus and stratocumulus, probably associated with uh, cold air advection. Maybe a bit of overrunning because we know that front is uh, somewhere in that area. All right, down in Texas, we can uh, see that disturbance. Run that into motion right there. Some good thunderstorms in the Houston area, Victoria, Port Aransas, and of course we catch a bit of that up here in uh, North Texas. Going out to the uh, northeastern US. Lots of clouds over the northeastern U.S. Looks like the mean flow is some kind of light south southerly. But overall pretty quiet in that area of the country. And then of course down to the south, Hurricane Florence. Uh, there it is coming on shore. And I've got a couple of uh, close-up loops of that. And we got a few storms going up in the Everglades of Florida out to the Tampa area. But definitely looks a lot quieter than what we've seen. You can see the uh, lack of storms in southern Georgia, Jacksonville, and that's probably due to some drier air f infiltrating southward. And that brings us to the infrared loop. We'll go ahead and uh, put that into motion there. And l let me start that out to uh, give you the time on that. This is going to be about noon eastern. And you can see the cellular look to the clouds and this is uh, the eye wall right here in the Wilmington area and you should see that start to subside as we go through the afternoon. So we're losing some of the strong convective uh, nature of that and pretty much nothing left by the current time there. So that really went into a decline very quickly during the uh, day today. But yeah, this has got a pretty impressive outflow pattern. And by outflow, take a look up to the uh, north, and you'll see that these spiral bands are not, they're not swirling into the storm like that. They're actually moving away and outward. They're moving like that. And that's because you've got all that air rising in the storm, and it has to go somewhere once it reaches the stratosphere. So it tends to move away and outward. So a lot of the spiraling is actually air moving away from the hurricane. A lot of people don't really make that association, 
but uh, these storms do have a very three-dimensional structure. you got the air spiraling into the storm at the bottom and air flowing away on the top. Okay, our stream looks uh, good. Let's keep things moving. Figured I'd uh, look at that disturbance there in Texas, and you can see it looks nothing like a tropical storm. Very uh, loose convection all the way from Waco, Austin, down to Brownsville and around the uh, Monterey area. So that's a quick look at uh, that convection right there. And looks like there's probably just a very weak circulation in there. Some of the some of the anvil outflow is moving south, others moving to the north. So that, that could be a little bit of upper level outflow in that area, maybe something like that going on. So that's probably a case where you might want to do a streamline analysis in the upper levels and maybe down in the low levels also. And we'll see if we can catch a little bit of the this outflow on the soundings. So let's see where to look. We're going to need to look in western Virginia, western North Carolina, maybe down to the Charleston and Athens area. So we'll bring up the uh, soundings and take a look. Okay, we'll try... Roanoke, Virginia. And what I'm going to look for here is uh, not only the cloud layers, but also the uh, winds. So the cloud layers looks like the base is on that about 30,000 feet. Typically the outflow is very, very high in the troposphere. Often on the 300 and 200 millibar charts, we don't we may not even see it at those levels. You might have to go up higher up to 150 or 100 millibars. So let's see what's going on. In fact, let me zoom that out just a tiny bit. There we go. So keep in mind, this is northwest of the storm. You can see the northeasterly winds. These, this is air spiraling into the storm right there. And then we see northerly winds here, and then they flip. Right about at that level, that's going to be about 34,000 feet. And then they become southerly. See that switch there from southerly to northerly. So that's where we're catching the outflow, up at about 35,000 feet and upwards. Let's try another example. Let's try uh, Greensboro. That's going to be a little closer to the uh, storm. And we can see what well, looks like inflow all the way up to about 35,000. We get above that, we do catch the outflow. And then we pick up a little bit of northwesterly winds, maybe a different circulation going on above that. And we'll try one more. Let's try Atlanta. Okay. So Atlanta, lots of north winds. And then it looks like once we get above 35,000 feet, we pick up a little bit of a southeasterly flow. So bringing up the satellite, Atlanta's right here, so that outflow is going to be moving that way, and let's see if we can see any trace of that. Yeah, just a very slight southeast to northwest movement on these uh, fragments here on that the tops of that spiral band right there. Okay, so that's an example of how to uh, synthesize the satellite with the soundings during a hurricane situation. All right, well, I guess enough of the technical stuff. Let's uh, start looking at the forecast. And I forgot, forgot to load up all these products, so we'll just work with what we have here. So these may be a little bit different than what we had last night. So the NEM, this is showing the big subtropical high centered over Illinois there. And then going through the day tomorrow, system is trying to move northwestward, but it's hitting that subtropical high up over Chicago, so that's slowing down the movement there. And then going into uh, Saturday and Sunday, our system starts falling apart there in eastern Tennessee. And it finally starts getting close to that zone of prevailing westerlies up there in the Great Lakes area. And so that should help draw the uh, system northward around uh, Sunday. 
Ridge is hanging on pretty tight across the southern U.S. into the southwest. So should see hot temperatures from Oklahoma into New Mexico and into the Tucson area there. New trough coming on shore there around Sunday. So a lot of uh, lift working on this area. And then the very end of the sequence shows that trough lifting northeast into southern Canada. So that ridge is really hanging on strong. Southwesterly flow in that area in Montana, Wyoming, Idaho, that should keep some of that cold air up in Canada blocked from going south. And just a quick look at the NAM there. There's the system working into the northern parts of South Carolina. The system uh, circulation is gradually weakening. So we're pretty much done with the 100 knot gusts. And uh, we're going to be dealing with probably 50s and 60s tonight, and then probably a little bit weaker tomorrow. And there it goes. Lots of remnants heading into eastern Tennessee, western North Carolina. And I'd expect uh, definitely some flash flooding in that area. Yeah, it's time to look ahead, so let's check that out. Precipitable water from the GFS. You can see how the uh, higher precipitable water is piled up in the center of that storm. So that these systems, they carry an impressive amount of moisture. This corresponds to probably about three inches of precipitable water and there's continually more coming into the storm. Also across Texas, looks like uh, over two inch amounts. So that's helping to generate the storms in that area. And we're gonna see some of that moisture surging northward in Oklahoma and Kansas. And as we get towards uh, early next week, low pressure up there in North Dakota, Looks like probably a weak frontal system extending southwestward, so there's not much movement on this. And part of the reason for that is the southwesterly winds. So that's keeping the uh, polar front just kind of in place in that region. And then going uh, forward into uh, Monday, polar front in this area. You can see the main Barrow Clinic low pulls up into James Bay, and then we get another one forming in the Denver area. So these are just kind of like ripples moving up the boundary. And then going into uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, we see that moisture surging north and looks like uh, maybe a bit of a warm front developing, or maybe a stationary front up there in Nebraska near Interstate 80. So that's a good pattern there for uh, convective weather, maybe in this area right here. And upslope. There's, I don't know if you can see the black uh, isobars in South Dakota and Nebraska, but there's easterly flow down there at the surface. This is on Wednesday. So we're bringing this very high precipitable water westward. As it flows up to the higher terrain, we get lift, and uh, that's a good pattern there for showers and thunderstorms in that area. I can also see some higher precipitable water sneaking up there in Arizona. So I don't know if that's going to recharge the... I don't know, it's not really a monsoon, maybe a weak monsoon pattern. Kind of looks frontal to me. Anyway, moving forward, I'm looking for the uh, next change. Yeah, we've got one little piece of that cold front surging southward on Friday. Looks like some storms going up along that front all the way down to northwest Oklahoma. Maybe a dry line setting up in west Texas from this 1030 millibar high up in Canada. So here comes some cool air coming southward. And flowing northward, high precipitable water. That's going to be a good setup for rain in northern Arkansas, southern Oklahoma, and parts of north Texas and Louisiana. And then going into uh, next week, uh, I guess that'll be about eight or nine days from now. That boundary just kind of sinks southward into the uh, southern U.S. You can see the uh, massive dry out as we get into late September across much of the Midwest and northern U.S. And pretty good high moving into the area, so it's starting to look a little bit like fall here. 
Okay, and the, we were uh, looking at the possibility of Isaac coming up into the Gulf. I didn't get the European model, so I'll just see if it shows up on the GFS. We're looking in this area right here. Let me move this up a little bit. Okay, checking out the Gulf, what's happening, kind of light and variable wind flow early next week, and then, yeah, we start picking up easterlies right in this area around the 18th or 19th, and about the 20th or 21st is when the European model was trying to bring that northward. And not not a hurricane or anything like that, probably just a weak tropical depression. Looks like the GFS may be picking up a little bit of it right there. And yeah, I guess maybe some of that surges up into Texas around the 21st. So I guess we're probably looking at increased chances of rain going into a late next week into the weekend and yeah it's feeding that frontal system so things will probably get interesting once again about a week from now and then towards the very end of the period looks like uh, I was trying to bring a little tropical system into Florida there it is uh, this is 384 hours out this is September 30th so likely this isn't going to happen but it gives us some indication that maybe things are still kind of active out there in the southern part of the uh, North Atlantic and is that it I think uh, yeah that's all the charts there and we're 38 minutes in so I guess I'm probably uh, done here let me take one last look at chat and uh, let's see Uh, Zalcuda reporting windy and rainy in Raleigh, North Carolina. Not too crazy. Had some brief power outages. Uh, Willie Greenway there in Georgia made it in. Got Mike R. there. Hello to Mike R. out there in San Francisco. Fort Bragg. Okay, yeah. Thanks, JT. Mike R. reporting cool and partly cloudy there in San Francisco. Feeling like fall. And yeah, California is on the other side of that frontal system. Let me just pull that up real quick. So the front, the uh, polar front is situated somewhat like that right there, and that puts the Bay Area and much of the Northwest under kind of a cool Northwest flow. Uh, storms and Saugai looks like the wind patterns holding a midsummer setup. Misty Sowards, tornadic or rotating storms. Well, most of that's over. A lot of the uh, convection is subsiding, so we're probably not going to see a whole lot more of that. But tornado watches are indeed still up. Uh, appreciate that, Justin Pulliam. Glad you like that red book there. Carl Burkhoff mentioning Florence had a stronger wind field yesterday and there were some circulations. Uh, Fun with Tech pointing out the radar evaluation. Yeah, that's a good point. We have went into some detail on that last night. So uh, pull up that video from last night and there's a good radar presentation that shows you some of those embedded tornadoes and how to find those. And uh, I'm not too sure how many of those were actually verified. That would probably have to wait a damage survey. But uh, at the very least, there were circulations in there, very strong circulations. And uh, maybe possibly some weak supercells, maybe some wall clouds embedded in that. And let's see. I think that's almost it for the chat. Working down to the bottom there. Ryan Toomey's... Talking about Isaac there. Yeah, let me just pull that up real quick. Isaac is now tropical storm. There it is right there. Winds 35 knots, 1,000 to 2 millibars. So that's almost normal pressure. That's just kind of a very weak system. And there it is. But you can see the gradual curvature as it moves past Jamaica, comes into becomes a tropical depression. And then we sh should see that start to appear in the Gulf there. And I believe that this area here, this environment here, is under a lot of shear. However, the sea surface temperatures are a little bit warmer in this area, I think. So we'll have to uh, take a look at that next week and uh, see what is in store. 
Ryan says September and October continue to be very active. Yeah, we've got that polar vortex up to the north. Got a very active frontal system that'll be coming into the central U.S. next weekend. So we have a lot to look at there. All right, that's about all I got for tonight. I appreciate you all watching, and we will be back on Sunday. So we'll take a break tomorrow, and we will uh, see you then and talk about the upcoming week. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate you all joining, and we'll see you Sunday. Bye-bye.